It's 1940. The Nazis have just embarrassed the British at Dunkirk. Adolf Hitler appeals to Britain to step down, otherwise what will happen will be the destruction of a great world empire, the destruction of which was never my wish or aim. Soon after Dunkirk, the Germans march into Paris. Hitler calls this the most glorious victory of all time. Hitler says Britain will fall and so will the Soviet Union. As for America, he states, I don't see much future for the Americans. It's a decayed country. Hidden in an elaborate compound somewhere in the Santa Monica Mountains, the LA Nazis are screaming for joy. The Nazis, they say, will defeat the US and Adolf Hitler will rule from his palatial Hollywood HQ. We guess some of you are now thinking the infographic show is high on drugs. Or more likely you think that this is one of our fictional scripts. It's not. But we'll forgive you for thinking that. Little do most people know that at one point in time there were the LA Nazis, and they really believed their mustachioed lunatic of a savior would arrive in the US and praise them for their service. And this is how it all came to be. Before the US entered the Second World War on December 7, 1941, many Americans had been dead set against their country fighting in Europe. In May 1940, after the Germans had blitzkrieged through Belgium, the Netherlands, and France, a poll was taken about joining the war. 93% of Americans said this is Europe's fight. We should stay well away from that holy conflagration, leave them to it. This wasn't because the vast majority of Americans supported the Nazis, far from it. It was because they didn't want to send young men over to Europe to die. That had already happened in World War I. Did Americans really want more body bags coming back from Europe? No is the answer to that question. Still, there were many people who were behind President Franklin Roosevelt when he said in March 1941 that the US would become the greatest arsenal of democracy. This is when Congress passed the Lend-Lease Act. It meant that the US could supply the British with weapons, planes, ships, and ammunition. But there was more going on in terms of American machines and tools being used in Europe. The giant American car companies Ford and GM were both later accused of helping the Nazis. Ford was said to have served as an arsenal of Nazism. GM said it lost control of its car plants in Germany, but there are those who have good reason to be skeptical. Some years before this, when Adolf Hitler was not yet at war but was enthralling the Germans with his bellicose speeches, General Motors' World's publication covered an event he spoke at. The story applauded this supposedly great man, saying things such as how wonderful he was with kids. Part of this multi-page story said, By nine, the streets were full of people waiting to see Herr Hitler go to meet the children. As for Henry Ford, he was no doubt an anti-Semite. After all, he was behind the publication of The International Jew, The World's Problem. Ford talked and wrote about the so-called Jewish problem. This impressed the Nazis. Hitler said Ford is a single great man. He once told a journalist in Detroit, I regard Henry Ford as my inspiration. He even had a portrait of Ford hung in his office in Munich. When Hitler hit the age of 50, Ford in Germany gave him 35,000 Reichmarks as a gift. Some years later, when the US Army liberated the Ford plants in Cologne and Berlin, they discovered company documents talking about the genius of the Fuhrer. That's not surprising when you hear that the only American person talked about in a positive light in Hitler's book Mein Kampf is Henry Ford. Was there rampant anti-Semitism in the US during the time of Hitler? Is the Pope Catholic? Might be the best response to that. In the same book, Hitler talked about the need for racial purity and how he thought he could make that happen through eugenics. This would later become the Nazis' extermination program. In the book, Hitler said, The German people should occupy themselves not merely with the breeding of dogs, horses, and cats, but also with care for the purity of their own blood. But let's remember who was a world leader in eugenics? The USA. Hitler admired the US for this, and he very much liked that the US still had a ban on interracial marriage. There were plenty of people in the US in the 1930s and 40s who agreed with Hitler when it came to racial purity. Hitler knew this. He once told a fellow Nazi, I have studied with interest the laws of several American states concerning prevention of reproduction by people whose progeny would in all probability be of no value or be injurious to the racial stock. He was, dare we say, proud of the US after it introduced sterilization laws. Hitler knew he could do the same to prevent untold numbers of non-Aryans from ever being born. In fact, in 1934, Joseph Desjarnet, the superintendent of Virginia's Western State Hospital, complained in the Richmond Times-Dispatch newspaper that the Germans are beating us at our own game. That same year, having seen how many people the Germans were sterilizing, a California eugenic leader named C.M. Goethe praised Hitler and the rest of the Nazis for their epoch-making program. All this is important when we consider the LA Nazis. 
As you know, Pearl Harbor happened, and before you could say schadenfreude, the US was fighting the axis of evil on the side of the Allies. This didn't mean everyone in the US was happy about that, not only because of the inevitable bloodshed, but as you'd seen, plenty of people in the US sympathized with Nazi ideology. Since 1936, there had been a German-American Bund, which was essentially an American Nazi party. Some of these people were desperately looking for scapegoats on which to blame their woes. Many of them blamed Jewish people for the economic crash that caused so much hardship in the US. They also blamed immigrants for things such as the usual refrain of taking our gerbs. They wore the Nazi insignias and did the Nazi salute, they marched in the streets, and the membership grew at an alarming rate. These nationalists were buoyed by the fact that a real American hero was on their side. He was the famed aviator Charles Lindbergh, undoubtedly one of the USA's most celebrated national treasures of the era. He was against American intervention in the war. He spoke at rallies held by the isolationist group America First. He was the life and soul of the isolationist party, and the Nazi party was quite fond of him too. Hermann Göring even decorated Lindbergh with the service cross of the German Eagle. Was Lindbergh really a Nazi sympathizer though? It's hard to say. President Roosevelt once told one of his officials, if I should die tomorrow, I want you to know this, I am absolutely convinced Lindbergh is a Nazi. He said to another official, when I read Lindbergh's speech, I felt it could not have been better put if it had been written by Goebbels himself. Still, at times Lindbergh seemed to criticize some aspect of Nazism. He was definitely anti-communist, but he was also very fond of talking about white Euro-Americans' racial strength and the threat of its dilution by foreign races. Lindbergh once told his many adoring American fans, Europe and the entire world is fortunate that a Nazi Germany lies at present between communistic Russia and a demoralized France. At that same time, he told them the fake news and propaganda was being used by the war agitators, the British, the Jewish, and the Roosevelt administration to get America involved in the war. And we're not talking about a small following here. Lindbergh's fan base certainly can't be compared to some monstrous far-right groups we have nowadays that hide in the far reaches of the internet, incessantly going on about their racial superiority. This was a guy that drew huge crowds when he talked. Sure, many of his supporters just didn't want to see young American men getting chewed up on the battlefields of Europe, but a lot of them, and we mean a lot, thought that the white race was superior. Some of them sympathized with the Nazis when the Nazis were talking about the so-called Jewish problem. It should be noted that these Americans didn't yet know about gas chambers or torture under what the Nazis called the Jewish solution. But as you know, eugenics was fine for many people. Racism was still rife in America. There was racial segregation in the South. There was racism on TV. As you can imagine, that most hateful group, the KKK, wasn't exactly against the Nazi ideology. These brainless lynchers and pathetic crossburners would have felt at home in Satan's toilet sharing it with Hitler. Few books have been written on the subject of Nazis and the Southern racists, but one we found said they did indeed praise Nazi Germany. As the young black college student Henry E. Banks said back then, the Nazi regime is bad, but are we in the US guiltless of this sin? The thousands of members of the racist Nazi supporting paramilitary group called the Silver Legion would have said there was no sin. These guys were totally on Hitler's side. Their leader, aka the White King, once said, the time has come for an American Hitler. They went around saying that the land of the free couldn't ever be free until it was rid of Jews and blacks and other minorities. They were even against the Irish coming over to the US. We guess these folks never spent much time looking at their ancestry and its history of immigration, nor the fact that at the end of the day, we all have the same ancestors despite genetic evolution giving us different shades of skin color as our ancestors crossed the globe. The Silver Legion wasn't exactly clued up when it came to evolutionary theory. Anyway, now that you heard all this, are you really that shocked that high in the hills over the Pacific Palisades, there was a group of Nazis hiding in a secret compound, waiting for the day that Hitler marched into the US and started doing the things he'd been doing in Europe? LA, by that time, was no stranger to Nazi sympathizers. In the summer of 1933, when Hitler had just become Chancellor, a bunch of American fascists held a joyful event at a downtown beer garden called the Brown House. This was the same name as the Nazi party offices in Munich. They had no idea that a spy named L1 had sent someone to watch over the events. Later, the Nazis would find out about L1 and called him the most dangerous Jew in Los Angeles. Now you may wonder why the Nazis thought about LA at all, but the US being as powerful as it was back then was always under the Nazi radar. 
The Nazis also understood the power of film, and Hollywood, of course, was the movie-making mecca of the world. Film was and still is entertainment, but it's also a great tool of propaganda. You'd be surprised how many movies you like that have been influenced. Hitler thought a lot about LA and Hollywood. He even once sent one of his own filmmakers to the studios of the up-and-coming Walt Disney. The filmmaker remarked after her visit that it was gratifying to learn how thoroughly proper Americans distanced themselves from the smear campaigns of the Jews. Disney himself used to attend meetings of the German-American Bund, which as you remember was the American Nazi party. Did Hitler want a power center in LA? Sure, he did, if he could. The Nazis said this city was even more important than New York, which is why they were in regular contact with the LA Nazis. Hitler and Goebbels were often on the phone with them issuing direct orders, according to an article in the New Yorker. Two of these Nazis were Norman and Winona Stevens. Norman was a wealthy mining engineer and Winona, an heiress herself to a small fortune. One of her main interests was metaphysical and supernatural phenomena. So when she was told by a guy only known as Herr Schmidt that he'd seen her in a vision that Hitler would soon rule the USA, she took it seriously. The wealthy couple was now sure the Nazis would win the war, and one day they would arrive in the US, so they decided to build a palace for them. They spent a whopping 4 million bucks making this palace, which is about 85 million in today's money. It's thought they might have gotten much of that from the Nazi party. They got to work on the landscaping first, which included creating vast gardens, a terraced hillside, water facilities, and a power station. Huge electronic gates were constructed at the entrance of the ranch. The main house was to be a four-story mansion, decked out in the best furniture money could buy. This was hidden down a hill about 650 steps from the gate. The reason for this placement was to ensure if anyone attacked the house, they'd see what was coming at them first. The only way in was through the gate, and there was a gatekeeper's house with a direct line to the main house. Also hidden was another small house just for the chauffeur. The plans were drawn up by one of LA's famed architects, Plummer, Werdemann, and Beckett, who were also behind the design of the Pan Pacific Auditorium. The gardens that surrounded the plot were purposefully built to accommodate a range of vegetables. There was an irrigation system to ensure the plants didn't die, there was a diesel fuel tank, a great big meat locker, and generators all over the place. And this was so the occupants of the house could live there for as long as they wanted and remain self-sufficient. The New Yorker called the place Hitler's West Coast White House, adding that it was to be what San Clemente was for Nixon or what Mar-a-Lago is to Trump. Hitler's house was to have 22 bedrooms, a swimming pool, a dining hall, exercise spaces, a dairy, a library suite, a music room, a laundry, maid's quarters, and the pièce de résistance, a large meeting room where Hitler and his guys could talk war planning. In the foyer was to be a fountain surrounded by the 12 signs of the zodiac. All around the ranch in the hills, American Nazis would act as stormtroopers, each trained in marksmanship and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Just to give you an idea of what it looked like at the time, this is what one of the visitors to Hitler's planned utopia said. A guard was also employed who unlocked the gate to admit me. The entire property was surrounded with a chain-link fence topped by barbed wire. A few people were present on the grounds. Goats, sheep, and cows were kept on the flatlands at the bottom of the canyon. The construction was moving along fine for a while. They had the gardens ready and the basic infrastructure was laid down, but they hadn't quite started on the main house when things suddenly changed. That was when Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese, and the US found itself embroiled in a war all of a sudden. The day after, the FBI arrived at their plot and arrested everyone, in all about 50 people. And that was the end of the dream. No building happened after that. If you go there today, you can still see parts of the project, the rusty pipes and the smaller house, but not much else. As for what happened to the mysterious Herr Schmidt, an LA Times article titled Trouble for Traitors dated June 30, 1940, seems to suggest he existed, that he fought in World War I and was known to US naval intelligence. And Norman and Winona Stevens, it seems, were released after a while. In 1948, they sold the plot to Huntington Hartford Foundation to be used as an artist colony. The colony shut its doors in 1965, and later in 1975, the city of Los Angeles bought the plot. It was only in 2016 that most of it was partly demolished, and some of it secured due to too many kids venturing down there and getting hurt. We imagine many of them had no idea they were wandering around a place designed for Adolf Hitler. Now you need to hear more about Hitler's secret life in the dark, true story of Adolf Hitler, or have a look at what if Japan was never hit by nuclear bombs.